I'd like to take a moment to thank my mom for listening to every episode. Now, my mom is the real reason you're listening to this show right now, but the sponsors have a little something to do with it as well. So I'd like to thank our sponsors too. Clio, Noda, Scorpion, TimeSolve. Built for lawyers, Noda's cloud-based business banking is perfect for your solo or small law firm. You want to spend your day helping clients, not struggling to reconcile bank statements. Noda's customer service specialists are here to help you. They only support attorneys so they understand the tools you use and the requirements you're up against, and they take your business as seriously as you do. Don't miss out on exciting new member benefits, including our partnership with Lawline to earn ethics credits for your CLEs. Online at trustnoda.com slash legal. Noda, banking built for law firms like yours. Terms and conditions may apply. It's the Legal Toolkit with Jared Correa. With guest Lauren Fernandez. A round of the all-out artery clogger. And then... I don't know. I was thinking maybe we'd grab some dinner. Relax. Watch a movie. You know, just have some time together. Just you and me. But first, your host, Jared Correa. The curtain slowly rises on another Legal Toolkit podcast. Who knows what desires lurk in the hearts of lawyers? We do. And yes, it's still called the Legal Toolkit podcast. Even though I don't know what a honing guide even is. I'm your host, Jared Korea. You're stuck with me because David Ruprecht was unavailable since he was checking in on the current prices for beans. I'm the CEO of Red Cave Law Firm Consulting, a business management consulting service for attorneys and bar associations. Find us online at redcavelegal.com. I'm the COO of Gideon Software, Inc. We build chatbots so law firms can convert more leads and conversational document assembly tools so law firms can build documents faster and more accurately. You can find out more about Gideon at gideonlegal.com. Now, before we get to our interview today with Lauren Fernandez, the CEO of Full Course, I want to take a moment to talk about cake. Or is it even cake? An actual television, well, streaming show, was recently released on Netflix called Is It Cake? And that's the entire premise of the whole show. Bakers bake cakes, and those cakes are placed next to objects that the cake represents. And it's the contestant's job to determine which is the cake and which is the actual object. Like, this is a shoe, and this is a cake that looks like a shoe. That's it. That's the whole thing. Now, this format does allow the host to do some cool things, like to wield a machete, and then use said machete to cut into the item that the contestant picked. If it's cake, there's a satisfying point at which the knife runs completely through it. If it's not cake, well, it's kind of hard to cut through a shoe, you know. And that's just devastating. Netflix is actually kind of expert in developing shows like this. Before this, they created another show called The Floor is Lava. This was just like is a cake in some ways where they took a simple concept and built an entire premise around it. So the basic idea is it's just like the kid's game, the floor is lava, where the carpet or the grass is lava, and you can't step on it. You play this at playgrounds and in your house with your kids. Except Netflix blows this up a little bit and creates a large room with garish objects that people can climb on. The lava is basically water with red food coloring, and every room has its own theme. Teams of three compete to see who can get from one side of the room to the other. The team that moves the most people across wins, and if there's a tie, total time of the finishers is the tiebreaker. When someone falls into the lava, the show is edited to make it look like they were actually swallowed up by the lava and died a horrible death. It's pretty fucking delightful, honestly. Though it must be annoying for the remaining contestants to wait for the producers to fish some loser out of the drink before they can continue to try to cross the room. Anyway, when The Floor's Lava came out last summer, I binged it with my kids. It took us only one day to watch all the episodes, and I'm still pissed that I'm continuing to wait for season two. Come on, Netflix. What's the deal? I've considered these shows and thought to myself, what does this say about our current culture? The inanity of these programs, the lack of attention span people have, the inability to hold on to multiple concepts at the same time. 
When I was a kid, I used to subscribe to Sports Illustrated. Yes, yes, an actual magazine. And they had a small section each week called This Week's Sign of the Apocalypse, where they covered this bat shit crazy stuff that happened in sports. And the whole thing was intended to make you lose a little bit more faith in humanity each and every week. Really lovely feature, right? But I don't know. I don't think trying to figure out whether something is a cake or a bowling ball or pretending that water with food coloring in it is lava is necessarily an indictment on our shared society. Life is hard, confusing, annoying at turns, and sometimes you just need to take a break from thinking about like anything at all. Like, There's never been more information. There's never been more people talking to you than there are now. And it's okay to take a break. And yeah, I'm down to read James Joyce's Ulysses, but sometimes I just want to know whether it's a fucking cake or not. We can have both things. And let's be real, if Netflix existed in Dublin in the early 20th century, James Joyce would have turned Samuel Beckett on to it. And then maybe it's a little bit more palatable waiting for Godot if you're watching as a cake while you're doing it. Now, before we get to our conversation with Lauren Fernandez from Full Course, Let's cut into this week's edition of the Clio Legal Trends Report, submitted by the one and only Joshua Lennon. What do firms with growing revenue have in common today? They're quicker to adopt client-centered legal technologies. I'm Joshua Lennon, lawyer in residence at Clio, and this is just one finding from our recent Legal Trends Report. Our research shows that firms with growing revenue are 37% more likely to use online payment solutions and 41% more likely to use client portals, two technologies that make it easier for clients to interact with their lawyers. The data is clear. Firms that find ways to make their services easier and more convenient for clients are the ones that see better client satisfaction and higher revenue. For more information on what tools successful firms are adopting, Download Clio's Legal Trends Report for free at clio.com forward slash trends. That's Clio spelled C-L-I-O dot com forward slash trends. All right, let's dig in, everybody. It's time to interview our guest. My guest today is Lauren Fernandez. She is the CEO of Full Course. Lauren. Thanks for coming into the podcast today. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. How are you today? Good, good. Um, we did a presentation together. Well, you carried mm-hmm. it where we talked about like alternative careers for lawyers. And you've had like a really interesting journey from being a lawyer to being something else. You, you might be able <laughs> to guess with the name Full Course, but I want to tease that out a little bit. So talk to me about your law practice. Like, how'd you get started? What did you do? And then why did you give it up? Like, why? how could anyone possibly give up the dream of practicing law, right? <laughs> right, the dream of being a general counsel, too. I mean, honestly, that was oh, my even goal. Better. Yeah, that was what I wanted. I just got there at 33. I should start by saying I have always been an entrepreneur. When it came time for me to go to law school, one of the things that my, my parents were very sure to counsel me on was you need to make sure you're going to a program that has a joint JD MBA. Mm-hmm. And so when I went to law school, um, I actually had an unfortunate death in the family. My mom passed away and I almost missed the deadline to apply for the MBA program. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget her saying to me, you need to get this MBA, make sure you apply. She really didn't want me to be derailed. Um, by her illness at the time. So this is all in my first year of law school. It was a lot. a lot to deal with, yeah. It was a lot to deal with. And so for me, I never, ever once stopped thinking about that promise I had made. My mom said, you're going to be sitting behind a desk running a company someday. You're going to want that MBA. So I did it. <laughs> she um, knew. I pushed through. <laughs> she knew. She knew her kid. Um <laughs> 
And it was hard. I'm not going to lie. I just was in a really, that's a dark space to come out of, to be in a very competitive environment like law school, to be in an extremely competitive environment, you know, albeit professional and friendly, of course, but business school is a very collaborative, present environment that you do a lot of learning together. Mm -hmm. That was such a cementing thing for me that even when I came out of the program and graduated in, I guess, 2006, I interviewed for both law and business jobs. And one person said to me, if you don't go practice law right now, you'll never have a chance to go back. The law is an apprenticeship. You haven't learned anything in law school. You right. need to go learn from some of the best in the industry how this is done. And if you want to make an impact that's where you need to start. So I sucked it up. The economy was in the toilet. I went and worked for one of Atlanta's <laughs> Atlanta's oldest and most well-respected IP boutiques. I became an IP attorney. I worked my high knee off. I like I was a litigator. I did their trademark stuff. I did all the all the soft IP just to make it work and um that was really how I began my journey in the law. And I'm so grateful for that first experience and the mentorship that I received from the senior attorneys at that law firm. And it was through that that I was given an opportunity to work part time, I basically was seconded over to a large client, which was an eye care division of Novartis Pharmaceuticals. So mm -hmm. I went in-house without actually leaving my law firm job for a minute. And then I actually ended up in-house full time. And that was really a truly a better fit for me. I loved being able to understand the business, to be around that deeper understanding of multidisciplinary folks working on the same project of commercializing a product, mm -hmm. to be working in over 140 countries, to have that level of much deeper responsibility and scope of work was just, I was home. It just made so much sense to me. I got a call one day to interview at Focus Brands with their CEO. And I thought my skills are so transferable. I could help them with my skill set and learn about an industry that I think is more aligned with my personal, you know, and just my personal likes. You know, I, yeah. I love being around people. I love solving problems. I very much enjoy food as an industry. So it made sense to jump over to Focus Brands and start their legal team there. So you kind of fell into it, right? You weren't going yeah. out to be like, hey, I want to get into the food industry, but you found a fit and you went with it, it seems like. I did. I yeah. did. And I think the really key takeaway there is know yourself. And I've said this several times through interviews. And I think to a lot of people, it would have made no sense to leave the amazing setup that is Novartis is a phenomenal company to work mm -hmm. for. But something about it wasn't 100% aligning with me. And, you know, you go through those in companies and you can write it out and then Maybe the next promotion is better or the next project is there. I just had this opportunity and I knew in my heart that it was going to be a better alignment for where I wanted to be. And now you've got your own company, right? It's food related? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a bit of a pit stop in between. I left Focus about seven years ago. Yep. And I started, you know, just interviewing for other legal jobs and nothing oh, really Oh, interesting. Felt... You, you were going to go and try and get a legal job before you found was... a wholly different company. Interesting. Okay. I Yes, I, I did a couple things. So I, I really loved the product dev piece of what I was able to help with at Focus and help grow mm -hmm. their licensing program. I was looking to go do that at another restaurant company. I'm like, this is so great. Look at yeah. how much money we can add to the bottom line and lawyers adding value. What's better than that, right? And it just wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be to find the same kind of environment where the lawyer was treated as a business strategist and advisor as opposed to someone who's there to clean up a mess. And during that period of time, I got several requests to do consulting work. And so I started doing that type of work as an ad hoc consultant, working for private equity groups who owned restaurant brands, up and coming restaurant brands, larger restaurant brands, et cetera, but not as permanent placement, which suited me just fine. It gave me some time to really think about what I wanted to do next. And I, as it were, I had decided to invest in a restaurant concept and I was looking and evaluating which restaurant to do that with as a franchisee. And I met a partner who helped me form Origin Development Group. So I started a restaurant development firm with him. 
And we ended up owning and operating 11 chicken salad chick units. Chicken salad chick. I like that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I didn't buy just one restaurant. I bought three and overnight (laughs) became an operating partner. And I, and I joke about this, but I'm dead serious. Like I rolled up my law degree. I put it away. I got a pair of non-slip clogs and a name tag that said (laughs) Lauren on it. And that was my job for three years. And we built eight more restaurants and had a very successful exit at the end of 2018. We sold our units back to the parent company. Hmm. And it was a phenomenal experience and very transformative for me. And I put it right up there with my four years at Emory. Oh, don't tell the law schools that. They're not going to like that. <laughs> oh, I, I, I do, though. I'm such an experiential learner. I mean, that would be my, that's always been my number one criticism of law schools. There's not enough hands-on learning, but yeah. that's a story for another day. Yeah. I think that that really just transformed my thinking about the industry, about what it, being an entrepreneur in that industry means, mm-hmm. what being a female and Hispanic entrepreneur in the industry looked like. Yeah. And after we sold our units, I had some money to reinvest in solving these problems. And that is basically how I came up with the idea for Full Course. Full Course really focuses on helping emerging restaurant owners who are independently owned and operated grow and scale their business in a meaningful way where we're achieving serious financial reward for them through a mix of product development, brick and mortar development and franchising. And we come in not only as an investor in those early stages, but we help incubate and accelerate the growth by using our development team to deploy that capital for them. So as a restaurant operator, you get to do what you do best, run your business. You get help from us in scaling it and in growing your team to help you run it as it's growing while we focus on deploying that capital towards all of these new revenue generating activities. All right, let me ask you like in terms of other attorneys, right? I mean, I don't know about mm-hmm. you, but every attorney I've ever spoken to, it's like piano man, right? Where everybody in the bar actually wants to do something else. Like this guy wants yeah. to become a novelist. This guy wants to do this or that. Every lawyer yeah. is like that. They have like, oh, you know, but yeah. what I would really like to do. So why is it that some people can like get over the hump and just do it? And other people get stuck in their career they may not love. And I'm not saying that people, there aren't people out there who love practicing law, but there are a lot of lawyers out there who want to do or try something else. Yeah. Okay. This is like the million dollar question, right? Because if you can answer this, it's the reason why most people don't jump from the law. And I think the number one answer for this is the comfort of it. So it is so much easier. Someone goes, what do you do? You go, I'm a lawyer. And that's just, you know done. You know, I think there's a certain amount of prestige to the profession. I I would like to think so, certainly, to the extent that- Let's hope, otherwise we paid a whole hell of a lot for a degree that doesn't mean anything. And (laughs) and I still renew my bar license every year and I keep current with CLE. And, you know, I think there's a deep reverence for what we do. It is not easy to constantly be staying on top of ever-changing law and precedent to be assessing for risk the way that we do, to be finding white space for our clients. It is, you know, a revered profession for a reason. It also comes with lots of really great trappings like decent salaries and benefits and all these other things. And so when you think about making the jump to something that's untested, the first thing that you have to overcome is this idea of you're losing the prestige and panache of the title. It's, it just is what it is. Yeah. And then the, the second thing is the uncertainty of the income. And so when I'm talking to lawyers who are unsatisfied in their jobs or unhappy in their careers, what I counsel them to do first before they think about any other alternative job for themselves is what is the least amount of money you actually have to make in a year to survive? Because yeah. a lot of us don't ever do that exercise. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I mean, for me, at the time that I made the leap from general counsel to restaurant owner and investor, I I mean, my run rate as a single person was like a third of what I was bringing home as a general counsel. The reality was staring me in the face. And so I think you have to unshackle yourself from the golden handcuffs first and foremost then you have to love whatever it is that you want to do more than you care about what people think about you and your title. I think that's like, I think it would be tough for a lot of lawyers to do what you did, 
which is like quit that gig and then go basically run a franchise. I think that'd be really hard to do. <laughs> and good for you for doing it. Uh, all right, let me yeah. ask the follow-up question, which is, I think the question that most people would ask next, which is, okay, mm -hmm. if I make the decision to go out and do something different, screw what everybody else says, how do you make it so that your skills as a lawyer work in whatever new industry is, or at least make it appear that way until you figure out what you're doing? The transferable skills question is probably a common one. Yeah. So you ask lawyers what they're good at, they're going to list out their areas of specialty. They're going to go M&A, <laughs> employment law, intellectual right. property. But that's not really what you're good at. What you're good at, there's a core thing, like group of things that you have been good at your probably your whole life. Public speaking, leading teams, organizing things. Like, And so I encourage lawyers to think about it less like what your legal experience has brought you and think about it more like what are the things that you bring to the table as a human? And I know that that sounds a little oversimplified, but if you can shift your thinking and kind of get away from the constructs of how we talk about each other as lawyers, you know, you don't introduce yourself to another lawyer and go, I'm an attorney. You say, I'm an intellectual property attorney, right? right. We know to right. identify each other by our areas <laughs> of specialty. And that's a funny thing, right? And so you it's again, really weird. your your talents are not your specialty. Your talents are the things that make you exceptional when you were in grade school, when you were in high school, when you were in college, and then later in law school too. That core kind of foundation, I think, is highly transferable skills. And most lawyers don't realize this, but they know business better than most business people do because they have to understand their clients' needs, whether they're in private practice or in-house, mm -hmm. to be able to be good at their jobs. And the best lawyers I have ever seen are phenomenal business people because they just have a knack for understanding business. And I think if you can look at those things as skill sets – it becomes a lot clearer how and where they may be transferable. You know, the easiest thing to do is go to something adjacent. And I shamelessly will admit right. that was part of my strategy. Like I have food and beverage experience. I have product dev experience. I was in the restaurant industry. So I had some decent street cred even when I was going to buy those chicken salad chick units and the territory. But I had zero ops experience compared to most. Yeah. But that's what a franchise system is for. They trained me and I learned from some of the best people that we had in our own organization, our own managers. And man, you just have to be humble enough to be willing to <laughs> to ask the questions and, and learn on your feet, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I think this is a really cool story. I think people have probably learned a lot just from listening to you for about 15 minutes or so. Will you come back in the next segment and talk a little bit more about food with me? Sure. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, so we'll take one final sponsor break so you can hear more about what our sponsors can do for your law practice. Then stay tuned for the rump roast. It's even more supple than the roast beast. Imagine billing day being the happiest day of the month instead of the day you dread. Nobody went to law school because they love drafting invoices for clients and chasing overdue bills. At TimeSolve, our attorneys have the tools to achieve a 97% collection rate. That means more revenue for the same work and turning billing day into happy day. Learn more about how to get to your time and billing happy place at timesolve.com. Now more than ever, an effective marketing strategy is one of the most important things your law firm can have, and Scorpion can help. With nearly 20 years of experience serving the legal industry, Scorpion has proven methods to help you get the high value cases you deserve. Join thousands of attorneys across the country who have turned to Scorpion for effective marketing and technology solutions. For a better way to grow your practice, visit scorpionlegal.com. Welcome to the rear end of the legal toolkit. As I said, this is the rump roast. It's a grab bag of short form topics, all of my choosing. Why do I get to pick? Because I'm the host. So today we're going to play a new game I just invented called the All Out Artery Clogger. Lauren, I'm going to describe for you a menu item at a fast food restaurant. And oh, all God. you have to okay. do is tell me which restaurant serves it. Pretty easy. Oh, dear. Right? Okay. You all can right. comment on the menu item as well. I've tried to pick really healthy choices here for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Menu item number one is called the Zinger Double Down King. Here's the description. 
This artery clogging meal featured a bacon topped beef patty sandwich between two fried spicy chicken fillet buns. So the chicken is the buns. There's no bun. Then slathered in rich barbecue and white pepper sauces. Though the lack of bread meant you'd cut back on carbs with this bad boy, at a reported 750 calories, it wasn't exactly waistline friendly. Gotta love fast food. All right, so who makes the Zinger Double Down King chicken buns and a burger in the middle? Boston Market, Kentucky Fried Chicken, or Popeye's? I don't think it's Boston Market. It has a hamburger in the middle? Yeah, it's like two pieces oh, of chicken with a hamburger yeah. in the middle. It's quite disgusting. I want a visual. <laughs> I feel like I need a visual. Um, Popeye's is here in Atlanta, and I feel like I would have heard or seen this if it were Popeye's. I like where you're going with this. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go KFC, even though I don't think they have hamburgers. But whatever. Let's go KFC. Is my final answer. You 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 would be right. You would be right. Yes. And I kind of cheated a little bit here. You can get this in America. It's like two chicken patties but there's like just cheese in the middle there's no yeah because they don't they don't serve beef i don't think in the american market yeah they do this in south korea Uh uh-huh so we we can put Uh a new spin on this game if you'd like we'll do the restaurant and then if you want tell me what country (laughs) you think it's i'll I'll take my best guess okay go you ready for two? Two is yeah. called the Cheetos quesadilla. It's pretty obvious what this is. It's a quesadilla stuffed with jalapeno flavored Cheetos and three cheese blend. Like the quesadilla is not enough. You got to throw some Cheetos in there too. So are we doing Taco Bell, Del Taco, or Qdoba? Oh my gosh. Okay. In full disclosure, I did a deal with Taco Bell. So I have a little bit of insider knowledge there. I don't recall there being a Cheetos one. Del okay. Taco. And what was the third choice? Qdoba. You know what? I'm just going to go Taco Bell because that was a Frito-Lay deal that they did with the Doritos taco shell. I'm going to go Taco I love how uh, you're using I, your inside knowledge here. I you know, would be I'm, right. All yes. Right. A follow-off. Taco Bell in what country? Unfortunately, you can't get this in the United States either. Curses. Oh, right. Cheetos. Cheetos are a huge thing in Mexico, especially the jalapeno ones. I'm going to mm-hmm. go Mexico. Very close. Well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Philippines. <laughs> Taco oh, Bell, Philippines. Shoot. My husband will be so disappointed because he loves jalapeno Cheetos and he's also Filipino. <sighs> yeah, he's got to travel to the Philippines for this one. Not as close <laughs> as Mexico. All right. The Mediterranean menu is number three. Which is, I guess, meatitarian as opposed to vegetarian. <laughs> These are three burgers, the full meaty, the half meaty, and the bacon meaty. <laughs> two beef patties, chicken patty, six bacon strip, oh, dear God. two slices of cheese, barbecue sauce, and onions is the full meaty. I'm sweating thinking about it. <laughs> I know I'm getting the meat sweats as I talk about this. If you're feeling like you want a little bit lighter fare, the half meaty is one less beef patty and only one slice of cheese. And the bacon meaty, on the other hand, loses the meat patty and includes two chicken patties, six strips of bacon, two cheese slices, and barbecue sauce. That is a full meal if there ever was one. All right. Five guys, McDonald's, or Burger King? I'm, I'm, best, I'm guessing this is an international one, too. I'm going to go Burger King on that one. Correct. Which country for extra bonus points, which I'm not actually keeping track of, but just for fun. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. That's a lot of meat. It's a lot of meat. A lot of meat. It's a lot of meat. (laughs) I'm just going to go like Germany. I don't know. I have no idea. All right. That's a good guess. It's New Zealand, actually. Oh, well, you know, grass-fed beef from New Zealand is where it's at. So I can kind of, yeah, I can get that. I get that. (laughs) All right. I got three more for you. They're all equally as fun. This one actually sounds really good. I don't know how you feel about this, but I would I would do this. Caramel popcorn frap. So the ice caramel popcorn latte and the hot caramel popcorn latte were pretty standard. But the caramel popcorn frap, I can't say popcorn, was its own <laughs> sickeningly sweet beast. The New York Daily News reports the beverage was a cold blended drink of espresso and caramel and popcorn syrups. I didn't know there was popcorn syrup. Topped with caramel flavored whipped cream and caramel sauce on top of that. The whole thing was then garnished with a large waffle cone full of caramel corn. 
that stuck right out of the top of the mound of whipped cream that rounded off the drink. That's like a whole carnival of flavors in a cup. So, who makes the hot caramel popcorn frap? McDonald's, Sonic, or Baskin Robbins? Oh, my goodness. I'm going to go with Baskin Robbins. I think the waffle cone is tipping me towards Baskin Robbins. That's a great guess, uh, but it's actually McDonald's. Oh, really? And Interesting. which country serves this? Belgium. Japan. Japan. Which was kind of a surprise to me, hmm. actually. They're usually not into super, super, super sweet stuff like that. That would have not have been my first guess. Right. Okay. okay. Two more. Two more. You're doing great. The barbecue Frankfurter pizza. If you often find yourself deciding between pizza and a hot dog, your prayers have been answered with the barbecue Frankfurter pizza. The aptly titled Calorie Rich Dish features, yes, hot dogs nestled into a pizza pie, which is then topped with a variety of sauces. This is the grossest thing I've uncovered online for fast food. <laughs> Who is brazen enough to put hot dogs on a pizza? Little Caesars? Papa John's or Pizza Hut? I'm going to go Pizza Hut. Yes. Correct. Now, for bonus points, again, which I'm not tracking. Which country? Can I can I specify a region? Yes, <laughs> I yes. Would just go, I would go like Germany, Austria, Hungary. Okay, I like, I like how you did region. But it's actually <laughs> Indonesia. Really? So you can only get the barbecue Frankfurter pizza in Indonesia. But you won't want to. Because it looks super gross. All right. I got one more for you. This is called the Buffalo Latte. According to a press release from the company, the unique beverage consists of freshly brewed espresso, steamed milk, mocha, and then to top it off, buffalo sauce on top of the whipped cream. <laughs> I honestly don't know who would drink this. Is it Duncan, Tim Hortons, or Starbucks? Oh my god, I, I, that's just a crime. But I'm gonna go. Tim I agree. Hort I'm gonna go Tim Hortons on that one. And you would be right. Now, really, this is if you wanted to go get the Tim Hortons Buffalo <laughs> Latte, you could get it in of all places, perhaps unsurprisingly, Buffalo, New York. You're kidding. This is true. <sighs> only place in the world you can get it. I would probably only eat one of these things, to be perfectly honest. Although the Cheetos quesadilla is something I could make at home, which sounds like it might be delightful. You got a favorite out of what we covered? I actually, fun fact about Lauren, my favorite mm. food as a child growing up, I was one of four children. We were not allowed customized lunches. Mom had to make a lot of lunches for school. So her <laughs> workaround was you can put whatever you want inside your PB&J. And I am notorious oh. slash infamous for putting crunchy OG Cheetos, not puffs, Cheetos in my peanut butter and jelly still as an adult. I am over 40 and I still do that. I love it so much. So I would do the Cheeto quesadilla because I also love a good quesadilla. So that would be my That jam. sounds amazing. All right, everybody, enjoy your peanut butter... Cheetos, jelly concoctions. Lauren, thanks for coming on today. You were a good sport. This was lots of fun. It was. Thank you. If you want to find out more about Lauren Fernandez and Full Course, visit fullcourse.com. That's fullcourse.com. Now, for those of you listening in Sandwich, Massachusetts, and in the spirit of, is it cake? Parentheses or not, I've collected some very simple short songs for our Spotify playlist this week. We're calling it on long songs. I feel like that's something Dr. Seuss would have said. And while Evan clearly wants to Netflix and chill, I'm still only on my first drink. Now that'll do it for another episode of the Legal Toolkit Podcast. This is Jared Career reminding you that fondant is really, really gross. Paralegal Voice is your go-to podcast for conversations about the latest issues and trends within the paralegal community. I'm Carl Morrison, and together with Jill Francisco, we host the show and examine the topics important to those seeking to grow their career. 
The Paralegal Boys can be found on the Legal Talk Network or anywhere you get your podcasts.